Good afternoon. I'm Jim O'Rourke, and uh, I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I've been asked to give the uh, my memories of the beginnings, the foundation of the uh, Matt Talbot Retreat Movement. Uh, the early part of these memories are more or less other people's memories that were given to me verbally. But uh, as I understand it, 1941, uh, three alcoholics, three AA members from up around uh, Ridgewood, New Jersey, made a, a retreat a layman's retreat up at Loyola Retreat House in Morristown. Uh, they liked it very, very much, so much so that they came back the following year and they brought 11 men in 1942. Uh, those 11 men decided they liked it so much they would try to get a retreat group of their own. And so in 1943, uh, they made an arrangement with the officials of the retreat house to have a certain weekend set aside, especially for uh, this group of alcoholics anonymous, and that was men only in those days. Um, the man that was in charge of the retreat, Tom P, he um, he had 76 men, prospective uh, retreatants, who would all agree and said yes, they would show up and uh, they would uh, make the retreat a success. However, when it came time for the actual retreat to be held, there were only 27. And we had a young sailor with us from uh, Philadelphia. Apparently they agreed to let him include the sailor in. I guess he was going out to sea and need, uh, needed a retreat. Uh, it was on that retreat that, uh, as I understand it, in the kitchen one evening, Saturday, Friday or Saturday evening, that a non-Catholic man, Horace Crystal, whose story is in the uh, Saturday Evening Post article, and uh, you'll see his name mentioned in the big book and other places too, Horace P., was very active in AA. He was talking to some of the gang in the kitchen at Loyola, and he said, he said, you Catholic fellows are very fortunate. He said, you, uh, you always carry a medallion or a, a, a rosary or something that, so that when you get angry or upset or in a tough spot, you can always uh, turn to this little uh, medal or medallion or whatever to sort of give you solace and strength. And that was the initial uh, uh, beginning of this medallion of ours. Um, our man who was the treasurer at the time, John uh, O'Connor from uh, the Bronx, he suggested a name. He had been reading a book uh, about the life of Matt Talbot, and uh, that's where we got the name from, Matt Talbot. The uh, material for the, for the medallions themselves was uh, furnished by one of our members, Al Coltrair from Yonkers, he was in the precious metals business and he got his, the, I think in those days it was sterling silver. It was the war years, 1940, 44 actually. And um, um, Father Collins, one of the Jesuits stationed up at Loyola, designed the medallion itself. This is the medallion. The front has the uh, cross and crucifix on it. And the... Uh, it also has the uh, slogan you've seen at AA, every AA meeting, but for the grace of God. On the back, there are three spikes and some chains, and these were relative to the life of uh, Matt Talbot himself, and the medallion number. That was rather important, because uh, whenever a man or a woman, later on there were women's retreats also, uh, when you make a retreat, you're given a number, and that number is yours for the rest of your life. If you lose the medallion, you owe it. By the way, there's no charge for the medallion. But if you lose it, it's up to you to pay for the replacement for, uh, copy. Uh, in that small beginning, out of those 27 men, uh, in one group, and now I understand, I think the figure I heard today was something like 190 groups have, have uh, begun over in the United States and in, uh, in Canada. And the last figure I heard on membership was several years ago when our, sec our uh, national secretary told us there were 40, 44,000 men and women who had made these retreats. And I think that's a remarkable achievement when you think that there's no, practically no uh, publicity at all. When or where have you read or seen or heard anything on TV, radio, newspapers, magazines about the Matt Talbot retreat movement? I've only seen one newspaper. That was from New England and uh, our secretary sent that down to me. But otherwise it's been all by word of mouth, which I think is fantastic. And uh, that's about the story of the uh, Matt Talbot retreat, retreat movement, as I understand it to date. Uh, it's functioning well, it's alive and vital, and uh, God willing, will keep on being alive and vital. And that's it. Uh, I've also been asked to uh, 
talk about the beginning of uh, the group that we're on today. Well, not this year, it is this group, Group 8. I get confused because we've had a couple of spin offs. We now have Group 108. But uh, the story behind Group 8 is interesting because in 1955, up at Loyola, there was a change in administration. And the new officials out there, prior to their coming into mm -hmm. office, uh, uh, if you were an un-Catholic, you did not have to uh, attend the religious services, such as the Stations of the Cross and Mass and so forth. It was uh, up to yourself if you wanted to attend. But this new administration came in and they made it compulsory that you had to attend. In fact, something like that came up at our business meeting today. And I made the point that in AA we have no rules or regulations. Uh, the outcome of this was that some of us, we pulled out. The, um, the treasurer resigned. I remember myself and another man, we were asked to order his books. We found everything in order. And uh, later that year, in the fall, 1955, uh, five of us got together. And uh, I have a little book here that's the early history of Group 8. I just found it the other day. I was going through some old papers. So bear with me. Uh, this was a preliminary meeting. It was held in Suffern, New York. And it's the names of, names of the five men that began this group eight. Jim Rice, he was a former um, mayor of Suffern. It was in his home that this meeting was held. Uh, w. Berg O'Brien from South Orange. Mickey Morley from Newark. I think he was a boxing champ in the U.S. Navy. Dick Minerick and myself from, uh, from the sake. Of the five, I'm the only one that's left alive, so <laughs> you can keep your fingers crossed. Uh, the first retreat, according to this note here, was held in October 1955, I don't have the exact date, but there's a note here, 17 men were present, and it was held in a hurricane. I recall this because we drove up from Passaic, we drove up Route 17, and uh, I'll never forget that, the, uh, the Ramapo River at the foot of the hill where the Carmel Retreat is, is located, uh, the river overflowed and they had to shut down a bridge. Uh, the priest that gave the retreat was a father, Ronald Gray, a Carmelite, and uh, I don't think he knew too much about AA or alcoholics because the topic of his talks were all centered about his experiences in the Holy Land. But that was the beginning, that those 17 men. And uh, the following year, in the spring or April, I was wondering about this just the other day to find out we, do have, we did have two retreats even in those early days. Early days. The second retreat was held on uh, April 20th a father Marcellus gave the retreat we had 32 men present and then there's a different Jim Rice was elected chairman Jim O'Rourke secretary Al Sorrell and John Sorrell treasurer and so on and this goes on and on each year uh, they retreat a priest from Boston father father Tom Foley uh, father the fourth retreat April 1957 etc 26 present in October of 1957 and this goes on uh, and here we are now, I think we're up to 1,900 or better medallions have been given out on this retreat. And there will be 10 more given out tomorrow. Thank God we've been very successful. We've had some very good officers here. Uh, at times we were really, <coughs> excuse me, booked all the flowing. And that's why we've had several spit-offs. There's been a spit-off. A new group started down several years ago at uh, Our Lady of Princeton in uh, Princeton, New Jersey. And another one started at the uh, Carmelite Retreat House, where we originally met. Incidentally, it had been shut down for repairs, and that's why we had to get out. Uh, and there's Group 108. And our third group started with another Matt Talbot Retreat up at the Graymoor in, uh, in, in New York State. Uh, but all in all, it's been a very uh, successful enterprise. I've been very, very happy and grateful to have been a part of it all. And I wish you all. <laughs> Another successful sober day, that's all. <laughs> We're going to take a few minutes and uh, talk about the life of Matt Talbot, his story. Who was Matt Talbot? Matt Talbot was a Dublin drunk. He was born in 1865, he died in 1925. The family had nine boys and two girls and Matt was the second born. Most of the boys were drinkers over there. <coughs> they lived in poverty in the tenements of Dublin. It was a grinding type of life. Father uh, was a drinker. He often 
crank up the uh, paycheck. He worked for the uh, port in Oxford in Dublin Harbor. And uh, they moved 11 times in 20 years. My mother had to hire her out as a charwoman in order to put food on the table. Matt had only two years of schooling. At the age of 12, he worked with Burke's Porter Bottling. And what the uh, young lads did there was they took the dregs out of the bottles, rinsed them out, and the dregs they put in the kettle. And they started to uh, sip that. And from that time on, Matt said he never drew a sober breath until uh, he had his spiritual awakening. At the age of 14, he went to a whiskey bar. He was daily drunk. He'd take his paycheck and post it at Elmira's Pub, a popular place in that neighborhood at the time, and he'd drink against it. And oftentimes he ran over. So uh, he would hock his uh, boots and his coat in order to pay it off. He would uh, go down into town and clean the carriages and the horses of the well-to-do when they were at the theater or at dinner. And as soon as he got his coin as a tip, he'd run to a marriage and he'd drink it up. There was at that time in uh, Dublin who, a fiddler who played on the street <coughs> corners and in the pubs. And Matt and his cronies were out on a toot, and they stole this poor fellow's uh, fiddle. And uh, when he uh, got his head together, <coughs> he went around trying to find this guy. He couldn't find him. So what he did, he said it was the next best thing. He had some masses said for this uh, person. The thing that happened to Matt was something that he thought would never happen. He always made work, terrible hangovers. But he went on a week-long binge. And in those days, of course, if you didn't work, you didn't get paid. Now many times, Matt would uh, stand his friends for some drinks at O'Mara's, and uh, he was known as a fellow who would buy drink for somebody who was really broke. But um, he stood there on the corner as they, his friends came up and walked. Many of them passed him by, didn't even acknowledge him. A few of them said hello. But no one offered to buy him a drink. And he was very uh, sore, uh, undone about it. He went home and he told his mother he was going to take the pledge. The drinking was not doing him any good. And his mother said, well, that's good, but just make sure that's what you want to do when you keep it. Because she had heard this many times before. He, uh, in the year 1884, he took a three-month pledge. He went down to Holy Cross College, and uh, there was a Jesuit there who would later become a spiritual advisor. And he went on long walks. He was not a particularly religious man. At one of these long walks, he stopped at Bush's Pub, another well-known water hall. And um, he walked in, and the bartender was at the far end of the bar with the locals. And of course, Matt was unknown. And he was looking to uh, get a drink. And that would have been his slip. But uh, the bartender sort of ignored him. And uh, Matt got a little bit ticked off, and he walked out. From that day on, he never carried any money with him. As I said, he was not a particularly religious person, but he did on these walks now, when he wanted to rest, go into a church and sit down. And I guess the spirit got to him. 
and he started to go to Mass. He went to work in Martin's lumberyard. That's why you sometimes see the statues of Matt with a timber by his shoulder. He was a checker. He had a little, a little shed, and uh, he would see that the orders that were being put up were done properly, he measured them out, etc. And he would often go into his little shed and say his prayers. Matter of fact, I was riding there one time down to a meeting in Central Jersey, Matt Talbot, the group meeting, and uh, Father Morgan Costco, who was the uh, vice postulator for the cause of Matt Talbot, was uh, visiting the United States. He was going to give a little talk. And he had with him the ruler, a folding, small folding type ruler that Matt Talbot used at this job. He was a very generous person. He gave to the missions. He gave to friends who were in trouble. He gave to seminaries. He mentioned one time to a friend that he gave them enough to uh, educate four priests over his lifetime. He then took the pledge for six months and then for life. His spiritual director was Father James Walsh, a Jesuit. And uh, Matt wanted to emulate the life of an Irish monk. His father died in 1899, and uh, he uh, took his mother in, and they lived a very happy life in a small tenement there in uh, that section of Dublin. He only had four or five hours a night's sleep. He was up at 5 a.m. He went to Mass. His breakfast was tea mixed with a little cocoa, a slice of bread, same thing for lunch. And for dinner, he might have some vegetables and a small piece of fish. He slept on a wooden plank, he used a block of wood for a pillow. And, uh, his uh, spiritual director taught him to read. And Matt started to put together a small library, which we still have, uh, Costello has that. And uh, of course, it started with the Bible. And he particularly was interested in books on the lives of the saints, and especially uh, the gals, as they call them. He says they were wonderful, St. Teresa of Lisieux, St. Bridget, and uh, this was his reading. He uh, was a member of the Third Order of St. Francis, and he would go to those meetings and enjoy them very much. He uh, was a member of the Working Men's Sodality, he went to those meetings. And he started to go on Sunday, he went to Mass every day. He started to go to Mass at 6 o'clock on Sunday morning, and he would stay in church through all of those Masses until noontime. As he was going to church, he was very fixed on his uh, chore, and uh, he ignored adults. That's why some of them thought he was a center. But not children. He'd always stop, talk to the children, and he would stop and pet the dog as he went along. He remained sober for 41 years. At the age of 67, in 1923, he had the first heart attack. Uh, he was able to get to the hospital by himself, and the chains that we hear about later, he had time to take them off, so they were not uh, seen. Dr. Henry Moore, who was a heart specialist for him personally, thought that he was a religious zealot. But later he found him to be a very kind and gentle person. We had a uh, retreat master several times when we were up at Carmel, Father Dan McMahon, who was assigned to the Dublin Diocese for several years. 
And Father Dan said he had, Matt's contemporaries, his neighbors, thought that he was an eccentric. 1925, on the way to church, he had his final and fatal heart attack. <coughs> At the time, the nuns were cutting away his clothes, preparing his body for burial. They found three chains, one around the arm, one around the wrist of the waist, and one around the leg. Now these were symbolic, they were not penitential chains. And they were very popular at that time. It was a practice started by St. Louis de Montfort. <coughs> there are stories that uh, the chains were embedded into his flesh, and this is not true. We also have those chains available. 1931, an inquiry into claims of holiness was begun in the uh, Dublin Diocese. In 1947, a Vatican inquiry was begun. It continued until 1972 when Matt Talbot was judged venerable. Now that means that his practices and his life of holiness could be venerated by the faithful. His remains are at the, his tomb in Our Lady of Lord's Church in Strom of Thurman Street in Dublin. I visited there as had some of the other members, and it's very, very interesting. Uh, the priests there are very happy to have that tomb there, located there. It's in a very tough section of town. And uh, when I was there, the, uh, the drug cab driver said, I'll keep the motor running. <laughs> And uh, his nephew had been murdered down the street of a gun fight a few weeks before that. I would recommend, uh, if you want to go further into this story of Matt Talbot, uh, two books by Mary Purcell, who just passed away a little while ago. But they're very thorough. They give you a good idea of the uh, living conditions of these people lived under in those times. And uh, you can get those at any Christian bookstore. If they don't have them available, they'll order them for you. And uh, that's about it. And thank you for listening. God bless you.